Okay, it's Brian, and we are going to continue talking about circular motion. At the level that we're dealing with it, circular motion, we're going to consider motion at constant speed. There's always an acceleration. It's towards the center of the circle, so there must be a force towards the center. And so it's a natural extension of the force and motion work that we've been doing. And we're going to also get into next time the idea that the force may be the long-range force of gravity. Before we go on, I just did a, I, I'm always interested in where words come from. And I'm looking, I did a quick etymological search to see what are other words that have the same root as circle. And some of them are fairly straightforward, like circuit, that makes sense. Circumnavigate, that makes sense. Circus as well, that was kind of interesting. Corona, a crown, that was interesting. Um, crisp, this was the one that really intrigued me and I looked this up and it's because like if you take something and you crisp it you get these kind of like little circular spirals which is sort of interesting and the name crispin means curly haired which is sort of interesting anyway this is more than you need to know but I'm very interested in etymology and so I just wanted to share that before we go on now, I want to remind you about this idea of apparent weight. And we said the apparent weight was the magnitude of supporting contact forces. Okay, that's how we define the apparent weight. And we'll see a couple of examples of that in problems we're going to solve today that have to do with circular motion. I want to remind you first of some details, though. If I have a motion in a circle at a constant speed, the acceleration is V squared over R, and it's directed towards the center of the circle. And so, therefore, if I have something moving in a circle, the, the net force is directed towards the center of the circle, and the magnitude of the net force is m times v squared over r. Just a reminder of those facts. But I want to look at a specific case, and this is a thing on the uneven parallel bars. That's no, it's a maneuver known as the giant swing. And what's happening is the gymnast is going through the circular arc like so below the center of the bar, below the bar. And I was really impressed by this when I saw someone doing this in the Summer Olympics. I took a little video clip and I did some analysis of it. And this particular gymnast that I saw doing this, who is pictured here, has a mass of 41 kilograms. Okay. And at the mo moment I captured the video, she was moving at about five meters per second. So she's moving at five meters per second below the bar. Now, if we're going to treat her as moving in a circle, we have to simplify her as a point mass. And it turns out, as we'll talk about in chapter 7, we can do that if we take the point mass as being at what's known as the center of gravity. And for a person, your center of gravity is approximately at your hips. So we're going to model her as a point mass about at the point of her hips. And she's moving, her hips are moving at a speed about 5 meters per second. We're going to treat her as if she's a single mass that's moving that way. And the mass that I'm interested in, the center of gravity, that's about 1.0 meters below the bar. And so I've taken this problem of the gymnast and I've reduced it to the motion of a single mass in a circle, one meter from the center of the circle, moving at a speed of 5.0 meters per second. And the question asks, what is her apparent weight at this instant? So first piece, we have to strategize. And my strategize is this. I'm going to say, I'm going to treat this as a circular motion problem. Okay, she is moving in a circle. So there's an acceleration towards the center of the circle. And since that's true, there must be a force towards the center. And I'm going to use my analysis of the acceleration to let me compute forces. And I'm looking for an apparent weight. I'm looking for supporting contact forces. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. And I'm going to model it further this way. I'm going to say, look, if she's a point mass, I'm going to say, I'm going to treat her arms as basically a rope. and I'm going to be looking for a tension force. Okay, and the force supporting her is basically a tension force. It's like, what is the tension in her arms, treating it as basically a rope, which also will tell me what is the force their hands have to be holding on with. That's the thing I'm interested in. What is this force right here? So my strategized step, how do I model the problem? How do I think about it? I'm just kind of like wrapping my mind around it. And with that done, I'm ready to prepare. Now to prepare, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to do two things. First off, free body diagram. Okay, so here's the person. 
and she's moving in a circle. And let's just remember the details of the circle. Okay, she's moving in a circle like so. She's moving at a speed of 5.0 meters per second. There's an acceleration directed towards the center of the circle. The center of the circle is one meter away. We know that that's true. Okay, the center of the circle, one meter away. That's her motion. Since the acceleration is towards the center of the circle, there must be a net force directed towards the center of the circle. And the forces that act on her, given that we're modeling her as a point mass supported by a rope that's basically her arms, there's a weight force which is downward, there's a tension force which is upward. And so the net force, the magnitude of it, is just going to be equal to the force in the direction of the center of the circle minus the force opposite that. It's just T minus W. And of course, that is equal to M times A. And it looks like we are ready to start doing some solving. Now her acceleration is given by this expression is V squared divided by R. The net force on her, okay, we said was equal to T minus W. We're solving for her parent weight. The apparent weight is the contact forces that support her. Well, the contact force could be tension, and it's basically her arms that are supporting her. Okay, so her arms are connected to her body. They are supporting her. Her arms are also hanging on to the bar. What we're looking for is, what is the tension force in this case? And the tension force is equal to F net plus W. Well, F net is equal to M times A. That's Newton's second law, and W is M times G. A is equal to V squared over R. Oh, heavens to Betsy, I have a value for V, I have a value for R, I have a value for M, so I can calculate A, I can calculate MA, I can calculate MG, I have everything that I need to be able to calculate what this force is, and that force right there, we're saying that is equal to her apparent weight. But I've reduced this to a problem where I know everything. I put numbers in equations, and if I do that, I get a value of 1,400 newtons. That's about 3.6 times as much as her weight, which is kind of, kind of crazy. That is, that is, that is a lot. That is a lot. So she has to be holding on with a force that's 3.6 times her weight. So if I was doing this, the force that I'd have to hold on with would be something like. 600 pounds? That is kind of crazy and I certainly would not be able to see that because notice her hands were sliding as well. So my assessment is, whoa, dude, this is intense. This is intense. But she was a world-class gymnast and so she's doing something which is kind of like epically amazing. So I'm just going to say my assessment is, wow, she's a world-class athlete and we can see from the physics just how amazing what she's doing is. Now let's take a look at another problem, and this is a problem involving a carnival ride called the rotor. And here's a lovely picture from the 1950s of some people riding the rotor, and you can see they're basically stuck to the walls of this rotating room. And what the heck is happening? Well, the room is spinning like so. The room is spinning. And the people, from their point of view, are stuck to the walls. But from our point of view, something very different is happening. What's happening is the room is rotating in a circle, and so they're being pushed towards the center of the circle, and what is pushing them is the walls. So let's take a look at this problem. And here's a problem that uses actual data. Okay, the radius of the room is 2.1 meters for the rotor. And let's take a person that mass 50 kilograms, and she's against the wall, and the coefficient of friction between her and the walls is 0.5. And the question is this, what is the minimum speed at which she must move to keep from sliding down the wall, and what period for the motion does this imply? Because if the room's not spinning, you don't stick to the walls. If it is spinning, you do stick to the walls, and you want it to be spinning fast enough that the people don't slide down the walls. So how fast is that? Let's do some calculations. Now let's do some strategizing. Okay, we said the room is rotating. So since the room is rotating, the person is moving in a circle. So we can treat this as a problem of circular motion, okay? And so there's a net force directed towards the center of the circle, okay? And that force has to be big enough that the person feels as if they're stuck to the wall, but of course they're stuck by friction, okay? So that's enough strategizing for now. We need to dig in and start doing some preparation. Now to prepare, 
we're going to do the same thing that we always do. We're going to do a motion diagram. We're going to do a free body diagram. And for the motion diagram, I'm going to do a top view. I'm going to do a top. And from the top, I have this rotating room, and I have a person inside the room moving at a speed v, and they're basically moving sideways. And so therefore, there's an acceleration directed towards the center of the circle. Okay, that's my top view. And now I want to think about the side view. And for, and for the, I'm going to draw a free body diagram, and I'm going to do that doing a side view. Okay, so here's the side view. Here's the wall of the room. Here's the person. Here's my person stuck to the wall. And the acceleration is directed towards the center of the room. And so as a consequence, there's a net force directed towards the center of the room. And the net force, of course, is just equal to m times a. And we know what a is. Okay, the acceleration is equal to v squared divided by r. And for right now, we're just going to assume a speed v. We're just going to use a symbol for it. And to stay symbolic, we're just going to call the radius r right now. And if we do a free body diagram of the person doing this motion, okay, there is a downward weight force. There's a normal force perpendicular to the wall. And then there's a force that's acting upward. Now, the force that's acting upward is parallel to the wall. And so that's a friction force. That's a static friction force. So that's my situation right there. Now, before we go on, um, there's some more preparing that we can do. And that's this. We want to write down an expression for F net. So I'm just going to rewrite my free body diagram. My free body diagram looked like this. Add an upward static friction force, a downward weight force, an inward normal force, okay? And remember, the net force was directed towards the center of the circle, okay? Well, F net we know is equal to m times a. It is always equal to m times a. And remember, the acceleration is equal to v squared divided by r, so that's helpful. But in terms of the forces acting, the net force is just equal to the normal force, because that is the only force that is pointing horizontally towards the center of the circle. And we know the net force is directed in that direction. So net force is equal to the normal force. And what does Newton's second law let us say? Well, let's look at the vertical motion. There is no motion along the vertical axis, so the weight force has got to be equal to the static friction force. So I'm going to write that down. Fs is equal to W. Now, I'm also going to say this. Remember, if I want the minimum possible static, if I want the minimum possible speed, I'm going to have the smallest possible normal force and the smallest possible static friction force. For that case, the static friction force is equal to mu s times the normal force. So those are my three expressions. I've got f net is equal to v squared over m times v squared over r, which is equal to n. fs is equal to w, and fs is equal to mu s times n. And with those in place, we can do some solving. Now for solving, we're trying to find the minimum possible speed. And then given that, we're going to compute the period. And that's fundamentally what we want to look at. OK, so let's remember the different expressions. We said f net was equal to ma, so mv squared divided by r. And that was equal to n. So that's my first expression. I'm just going to put it here. mv squared over r is equal to n. And we also said that the static friction force, Fs, is equal to the weight force. But the weight force is equal to m times g. So Fs is equal to m times g. And we also said that if we're going at the slowest possible speed, the static friction force is, is the limit of what it can be. Fs is equal to mu s times n. OK? And these are our expressions that we have. And then what we have to do at this point is we basically just have to wield the magic algebra hammer and solve for, we're looking for v. So let's do this. I'm going to take my top expression here. I'm going to solve it for v. OK, v is equal to n times r divided by m. And I want the square root of that. OK, I want the square root of that. But now let's do some solving for n. And I'm going to use this expression right here n is equal to fs over mu s. 
But Fs, we said, was equal to weight, which is equal to m times g. So m times g divided by mu s is what I have. That's what the normal force is. And I can take that expression, and I can put it inside my expression for the velocity. And if I do that, I get this. I get v is equal to the square root of m times g over mu s. And everything in there is also times r. And I'm dividing that by m. Now something good happens. The mass cancels. And that's important because if the mass didn't cancel, that would mean you'd have to spin it at different speeds if you had different mass riders. And that doesn't make any sense. But this gives us an expression that we can solve for v. We can solve this expression for v. Having solved it for v, we can figure out the period. And if I have motion in a circle, the period for motion in a circle is just 2 pi r divided by v. And so with that in hand, we can solve for the period. And so now we're down basically to putting numbers and equations. We know everything in this expression. And once we've computed the speed, we've got everything in this expression. And we get a speed of 6.4 meters per second, which implies a period of two seconds. And then the final piece of the puzzle is an assessment. Does your answer make sense? And if you ask me, I have ridden the rotor and a period of about 2.0 seconds sounds about right. So it matches my experience of how the world works. One thing I want to point out is if you do this, and I strongly advise against riding this ride, um, if you're ever in a place where they have something like this, you are basically held to the wall. Um, you're not held to the wall. The wall is pushing in on you with a normal force and it's pushing up on you with a friction force. So the thing that's working against gravity is friction, and the friction force is equal to the weight force. And when I rode the ride, it was the 70s, I was wearing a kind of a slick polyester shirt, and I was wearing um, corduroy trousers. And so basically, I was being held up by friction force on my pants. And not only was I nauseous when I got off the ride, I had the kind of the worst wedgie imaginable because I spent the time of the ride basically being held up by my trousers. So um, strongly advise against ever doing this. Now, I want to point something out. I've said you shouldn't ride in a ride that's a rotating room, but here's the thing. We live in a rotating room. You live on the Earth, and if you live on the Earth, the Earth is rotating. And as a consequence, there are some apparent weight things going on. Um, there's The reading on a bathroom scale is not actually the same as your true weight, and that has to do with the rotation of the Earth. And that's the subject we'll treat when we return to talk about gravity which is related to the topic of circular motion. And that's something we'll do in the next set of slides.